Mortal Kombat has come an incredibly long way since its humble beginnings as a game that convinced some adults that video games were the work of Satan. Though the series still has recognisable elements to this day, like combos, colourful characters, and gory fatalities, there's no denying how much Ed Boon's and John Tobias's love child has changed over the years, becoming bigger, faster, gorier, and confusing, uh, confusing. The main draw of Mortal Kombat for most fans is the gameplay, which is expected, as fighting games can't really rely on other components that can make a mediocre game better, because if the gameplay sucks, the whole game sucks. Recent Mortal Kombat games overall have had pretty good gameplay. Admittedly, the gameplay in the series was at its peak in 2011 with the first Mortal Kombat reboot, as every kick, projectile, and ball punch felt clean and satisfying, and the action was so quick it felt like you couldn't let up for even a second. I've still enjoyed every Mortal Kombat game to come out after 9 as well. While they weren't as fast or satisfying, X and 11 still had a lot of great stuff to offer but I'm one of those fans who is more interested in the story and characters of Mortal Kombat. The friendships, the rivalries, the family squabbles, and the ultimate battle between good versus evil are what have kept me coming back after every game. Despite liking the story, I'll be the first one to admit that Mortal Kombat storytelling can become pretty convoluted at times, and if I'm gonna go a step further, I'd even say it's a bit silly, which was especially obvious in Mortal Kombat 11. Now the game had some good ideas and brought back some fan favourite characters, but the whole Kronika and Hourglass plot really didn't work, and it felt like the addition of the Aftermath DLC just made things a little bit more confusing. A full reset of the timeline felt like the best thing to do for the series, as it had got to the point where Mortal Kombat was backing itself into a corner. Where do you go from, Bold Woman wants to reset time? The team at Netherrealm did the right thing by hitting the restart button, and having Liu Kang fill in the role of Raiden was an interesting and exciting first step for the franchise to take. Of course, we would have to wait a few years before we could see the extent of how much this new timeline would be different from the last few, but once the trailers started to drop, things looked promising. The brand's new takes on most of the characters made everyone excited for something fresh and innovative. For so long, Mortal Kombat characters have been trapped inside of a singular personality trait for 20 plus years that puts them into categories like dumb jobber, just evil, just good, and who can forget, boring as f Coming up with new destinies for these characters had potential to do wonders for the story. However, the story sneak peek did unsettle me a little bit when I saw a familiar blue-eyed bald lady spewing venom into Shang Tsung's ear, which made me worry that Mortal Kombat 1 would annoyingly repeat the same mistakes the past game made. So when the time came to hop onto Mortal Kombat 1, I immediately ran straight to the story to see what was going to unfold for Liu Kang and his buddies. What in the actual fuck? Good evening, Johnny Cage. I am Liu Kang, protector of Earthrealm. May we yeah. But what was I met with? Actual good plot points, character arcs, and interesting takes on characters? All the same old underuse of characters, convoluted plot, and wasted potential. Honestly, a bit of both. Mortal Kombat 1 felt like it was trying so hard to do something different and interesting, but then as the game goes on, you feel the same old bad habits start to slip in, until you're left at the end of the game confused as to whether or not you enjoyed those 6 hours, and I think I mostly did. It was a huge step up from 11 in my opinion, as it didn't feel like Netherrealm was throwing everything at the wall to see what stuck. Well, towards the end it did, but I'll talk about that later. The story, of course, takes place in Liu Kang's new timeline. Having been the Keeper of Time for eons, he decided to give that life up to be Earthrealm's protector, as a demigod. He has moulded the universe in his own way, giving many of his old acquaintances peaceful lives, but hilariously decided to make Shang Tsung a fake magician, probably as revenge for all the shit he pulled in past timelines. Liu Kang is dead. Things rarely ever remain simple in Mortal Kombat, however, as young Shang is introduced to a Kronika-looking wannabe who promises him great power if he joins her, and so classic Shang Tsung is awakened once again. The first part of the game focuses on Liu Kang assembling Earth's mightiest heroes, I mean defenders, for the upcoming tournament that will be held in Outworld in front of the illustrious Sindel and um, her two uh, lovely daughters. <laughs> Among these champions are Johnny, old reference equals funny, Kenshi Reeves, baby-faced Ray Raiden and Mr. Hat. <laughs> 
the boys head to the tournament, Raiden smashes it out of the park, and all's well and ends well. Obviously that's not true. Turns out Shang Tsung has already manipulated many of Outworld's key warriors and influencers, convincing them that Liu Kang wants to take over Outworld, leading into the all too familiar conflict between the two realms, with some twists along the way. The majority of the story I actually really enjoyed. The beginning, up until say three quarters of the way in, had a lot of interesting concepts and plot points that made it feel like Mortal Kombat was actually going in a new direction, and that's mostly down to the characters. Dialogue in Mortal Kombat has always been on the cheesy side. Going somewhere, Jarek? Jax! I thought you were going to- Thought I was what? Dead? Like my partner you just tossed off the cliff? I'm- I'm sorry, Jax. Please. Though there have been some outstanding lines and performances, Scorpion's revenge on Quan Chi is probably one of my favourites in the series, writing A-list scripts clearly wasn't at the top of Netherrealm's to-do list, but MK1's writing feels levels above MK11's. Characters' emotions and reactions for the most part feel authentic. This game has some of the best renditions of beloved characters we have ever seen to date. Some of my personal favourites were Liu Kang, Reptile, Baraka, Kenshi, and Melina. Liu Kang has been the poster boy for the series forever, constantly being championed as, well, Earth Realm's champion. And yet despite this, there's never really been much to him. I've always been more interested in Kung Lao, as he's constantly trying to prove himself to Raiden and his peers. I also think that Kung Lao was great in this game, but Liu Kang is very much a big part of the story. Reptile and Baraka finally got their chances to shine in the story mode, rather than just being dumb, inept, yes-men for Shao Kahn, and being evil because ugly. <laughs> I mean, Reptile's definitely not ugly anymore. Just look at this handsome oh, lad. Baraka and Reptile were both outcasts in their own way. Baraka, ridden with Tarkot, was exiled from his home and into the outskirts of Outworld with other Tarkot victims, and Reptile was run out by his fellow Lizardmen because he can turn into a human and was forced to work for Shang Tsung out of fear that he would kill his family. Plot twist, they were already dead. Cheer up, Sizoth. I'm reuniting you with your family. They're dead? You killed them! Got it. Instead of them siding with some of the most despicable and untrustworthy people to exist that wouldn't hesitate to betray them at a moment's notice, they actually agreed to help Liu Kang and the gang by helping them locate Shang Tsung and getting Johnny and co out of Outworld unharmed. Well, mostly unharmed. <laughs> Kenshi was another standout for me in this game, especially the friendship between him and Johnny. I've always been a fan of Kenshi, just because he seems like a nice guy, but we've never really peeled back the eye cover to see what layers lie beneath. His struggles to redeem his family's name had never really been explored before, but watching his obsession with Sento subside for the care of his friends, like Johnny, was great growth for his character, and actually seeing Kenshi lose his eyesight to Melina in such a gruesome way was genuinely shocking. Speaking of Melina, this is by far the best incarnation of her to date. In the past, Melina was pretty one-dimensional, a typical femme fatale character, and while MKX tried to break away from this characteristic, she died before it could be fully realised, and MK11's version suffered from DLC syndrome, and so wasn't able to get fleshed out in the story mode. This Melina is the actual sister of Katana, rather than just being a clone grown in the flesh pits, and is next in line to the throne behind her mother Sindel. However, she has been infected by Tarkot, and suffers from some of the early onset symptoms of the disease, making her a mindless and violent beast. This starts to make Melina doubt herself as a worthy ruler, as she begins to think Katana may be chosen before her. All of this builds up throughout the story, making you think that Melina will become jealous of her sister and lash out at her mother for berating her, but rather than doing the cliched thing and turning evil, she becomes motivated to show herself as a cunning warrior that acts in Outworld's best interest, rather than seeking power for personal gain. There were many other good characters in the story, like Johnny, Ashura, Shang Tsung, and Madame Bo, but these were my favourites. Most of the main narrative was also really interesting, showing the slow build-up to the distrust of Liu Kang and Earthrealm, as Shang Tsung swayed the minds of key Outworld players, it was a nice change to just having Outworld outright declare war on Earthrealm. The tension building between characters and seeing the chaos unfold as both sides recruited allies to their cause felt like it was building up to something truly special. Then the final few acts happened, and I was left feeling a little disappointed and confused. Before I get into the final acts of the game, I want to talk about some elements in the story that disappointed me. The Lin Kuei was a big misfire in my opinion, because the trailers suggested that they would have a big role to play in the story, but failed to ever leave a mark. The only mark they left was on Madame Bo's head. <laughs> 
Smoke and Scorpion offered very little to the story, kind of just standing behind Sub-Zero as he spoke in an ominous and threatening tone. I'm going to talk about Sub-Zero again later because there's a plot point involving him that I really wasn't a fan of. A big part of this game's marketing was the fact that it was embracing the 3D era of Mortal Kombat once again by adding characters that had been missing from the series for over 15 years, like Havoc, Natara, Darius, Ashura, Li Mei, and many others. There have been references to these characters over the years, but this is the first time they've been playable in ages. Granted, a lot of them are cameos only, but hey, it's better than nothing. I'm sure everyone was happy to see these classic characters again, but unfortunately, many of them were severely underused. Reiko is General Shao's second in command, often seen doing his dirty work for him, like roughing up Earthrealm defenders and killing red shirts, but that's all he does, and he doesn't do it very often. He has little to no dialogue, and acts like an even less interesting jobber than Reptile and Baraka ever were. Another character that was hyped up in promotional material that didn't end up having any impact whatsoever was Natara. Netherrealm seemed to go all out to try and get people excited for Natara by having her be voiced by Megan Fox, and after playing the story, I still don't understand why they went all out to get a big named celebrity to play a character that has so little dialogue in the game. Mortal Kombat characters are not known to be the brightest bunch in gaming. Often when playing a Mortal Kombat story, you'll be left scratching your head at some of the decisions made by characters, and it happens in this game as well. As of course is tradition. A notable example that felt so irritating to witness was when Kenshi, Kung Lao, and Johnny Cage go to spy on Shang Tsung and attempt to save Melina, as they believe Rain, Tanya, and Shang Tsung are trying to inject her with poison, and once Kenshi shouts at them for trying to, in his mind, poison the princess, they decide to not actually tell him what they're doing until it's too late. Tanya is the most annoying in this situation, because unlike Rain and Shang Tsung, who are actually plotting evil shit, Tanya isn't an evil character, and yet decides not to defend her actions with the princess, after Kenshi has just essentially accused her of trying to poison her girlfriend. Surely you would say, whoa, what are you talking about? Another thing I couldn't wrap my head around is why it was so difficult to find Shang Tsung, when Liu Kang has arguably the most powerful friend in the universe in the form of Garrus, who can teleport to and from anywhere, as we saw constantly throughout MK11, and yet he never once offers to go looking for Shang Tsung selfish. Speaking of selfish, Bihan just had to go and fuck it up again, didn't he? Him and Kwai Liang can't just have a nice brotherhood. Bihan's betrayal was hinted at throughout the trailers of the game, but I thought it would have come a little later than it did, but it's like Bihan is just itching to turn evil. Despite being the Grand Master of the Lin Kuei, and being a self-proclaimed great warrior, he immediately falls for Shang Tsung's promises of restoring the Lin Kuei's power in Earthrealm, even though Liu Kang has mentioned at least a thousand times at this point that Shang Tsung is a piece of shit who can't be trusted. It just made the end of the game feel predictable, but you can overlook the odd bad story decision and or bad character, but what I don't like about the game is that towards the end it feels really, really rushed. The final acts of the story mode suggest that Netherrealm went into it thinking bigger equals better. The ending tries to cram so much into an hour and a half like three games worth of plot devices. Quan Chi and Shang Tsung are the two main threats in the game, creating a new deadly alliance, and the game would have worked fine if this was the focus, but again, Netherrealm went in with the throw things at the wall and see what sticks approach. Turns out both endings of the MK11 Aftermath DLC were canon, as the fight between Liu Kang and Shang Tsung ripped apart time, creating two separate timelines. Now I actually enjoyed this decision to make the two timelines canon, as it meant fans who chose either Liu Kang or Shang Tsung didn't have to fight to the death over over which one was actually canon. It would be sensible to have the main conflict be between these two timelines, but again Netherrealm turned around and said, hey you know what's better than two timelines? Two million timelines. To combat Shang Tsung's dark forces, Liu Kang goes around to other timelines to find the most powerful warriors to fight by his side, which involves Katana, Raiden, Kung Lao, and about 28 million other variants of these characters. Shang Tsung sees this and does the same thing, leading to an endgame-esque fight that while is full of funny moments and crazy variants of characters that I hope to see again, it kind of felt like the series was jumping the shark even more than it did in MK11. Where does the series go after this? While the final cut scene of the game teases that a variant of Havoc will be the new main bad guy in a future sequel or potential story DLC, but how can they top all the crazy stuff that happened in this game? The crazy variant fight would have been perfect for Havoc, but now it's going to be hard to come up with a suitable next step to take this new era in. It feels like they crammed a trilogy's worth of content into the last hour and a half. The story mode would have been so much better if they focused on one main plot point, but sadly Mortal Kombat seems to be a parody of itself now. Despite these setbacks, the story definitely took steps in the right direction with most of its characters, which is ultimately what I'm here for. We can't abandon tradition. I bet you're fucking late. You know what?